Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Microeconomics here. I'm talking a little bit about some long run adjustments for the individual business. Uh, first thing I want to mention here is about long run decisions. In the long run, there is no shutting down. In the long run, the decision is either stay in the market or exit the market, stay and produce or leave. As the old Clash song went, darling, you got to yeah, let me know, should I stay or should I go? And that's the thing here, though. As long as P star, which means optimal price for not perfect competition and market equilibrium for perfect competition, is greater than or equal to the minimum long run average total cost. We just say long run average cost, but it's actually technically long run average total cost. Either one is correct. The firm remains in the market. But if P star for the long run is below the minimum long run average total cost, that firm is going to decide to exit the market because long run economic losses are not something any entrepreneur wants to experience. And so we just do not want to go there. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead here and talk about long run cost function graphs because this is something that kind of matters tremendously here. In the long run, the long run average total cost curve is a bowl shaped curve. And we also just have the upward sloping piece of the long run marginal cost because that is the business end of things. But I want to mention here that the actual scale of length for the horizontal average is a lot longer. Reason, as Q gets bigger, the firm's physical size is changing. Now, when we learned about short and long run not too long ago, we talked about the fact that in the short run, the scale of operation or physical size is fixed, but in the long run, the scale of operation or physical size is variable. And so when quantity of output gets bigger in the long run, you get a bigger size business and some less output means a smaller size business, a lot more flexibility in the long run. Please notice also that similar to the short run, the long run marginal cost will penetrate the long run average cost or intersect it, I should say, at its minimum. That is just a standard. That's just the way it always works with these two curves because of an actual calculus relationship that's not necessary to know for the survey courses in micro. Um, please just also remember there's only one long run average cost curve. It is both average total and average variable for the long run because why? All costs are, if you said variable in the long run, you were correct. Now, also this personal this purple segment of the long run marginal cost curve serves as the individual business's long run supply curve. The firm is not in the market and not supplying if the price is below this point, but if it's equal to or greater than it, it will be supplying. And so this is the long run supply curve. What's important to know though here is that business size keeps changing as you move along the curve. But the thing is, the size that is associated with this minimum point has a special name, MES, which stands for Minimum Efficient Scale. This represents an ideal size. The reason why the size is considered ideal is if you look at the long run average total cost, the average cost to produce one unit of output is as low as possible at whatever size contains the minimum. Sizes that are smaller, you'll notice the dollar value for the average total cost is higher. They have larger per unit costs of production. And then sizes that are bigger than this one also have higher per unit costs of production. This is where the per unit cost of production is minimized. And so that means the business is productively efficient, meaning it is using its resources in its most best way possible. And it's allocatively efficient, meaning you don't have resources sitting idle or being wasted. So both production and allocation of resources, production of goods and services are as efficient as possible. And you can't squeeze more blood from that turnip as the saying goes. Now, some other things to talk about. When the firm size changes in the long run, we have concepts that are going with this here. When the firm size gets bigger and the average total cost drops per unit of output, we say the firm experiences economies of scale. So when the firm is getting larger, it may be able to take advantage of economies of scale that it could not take advantage of it smaller. I mean, you don't see assembly lines and automation in a lot of small businesses because they're too expensive, they're too large, and really uh, labor is a better thing to use in those instances. But in factories, especially, there's a lot more automation now, assembly line robots that don't ask for coffee breaks, and don't ask for two-week vacations, and don't call in sick. Those types of areas there can actually be exploited much better because you're producing a lot more items in a lot larger space. And so the bigger businesses can take advantage of that large machine capital. That's one example of an economy of scale. 
Another example is I had a friend of mine that owns some burger joints and he has opened up more locations. And with every location, his cost per pound of beef, his cost per tray of buns, his cost per pound of cheese, his cost per bushel of onions and tomatoes has dropped because he's buying so much more from his material suppliers. They are charging him less per unit, which means the cost to make one single burger keeps getting smaller and smaller. Volume discounts on raw materials is an example of an economy of scale. Now, minimum efficient scale is at the bottom. But notice you get sizes that are bigger. You start seeing, whoops, as the sizes get bigger, the average total cost per unit is getting bigger again or higher. That's where like some inefficiencies are setting in, but we don't call those inefficiencies. We call those diseconomies of scale. Class, have you ever had to deal with a business where you had to go through so many departments just to get a simple task fixed for customer service? That's what you call a situation called bureaucracy or red tape. Too many layers of management, too many people who have got too many subdivided jobs and simple jobs that should be completed to help a customer aren't being completed because you're hearing too much, that's not my job and not enough, oh, let me take care of it or I can do this thing. General Motors had these problems. That's part of the reason why they ended up closing about half their divisions about a, t a decade ago is because they had so much bureaucracy, a batch of parts that was shipped to a factory that was defective. The floor manager couldn't call the parts supplier directly to order new parts. He had to go up a chain of command to a vice president who called a vice president of the parts supplier and then went down the chain of command. They should have eliminated all those middlemen and taken care of the problem faster and Otherwise, it wouldn't have uh, assembled a bunch of cars with defective gear shifter boxes or defective airbags and ended up having to do a bunch of recalls and pay off a bunch of lawsuits. Those diseconomies of scale cost General Motors and several car companies dearly. And if you take a look at some of the car companies like Toyota, Mitsubishi and Honda, they have a lot fewer layers of management and people at lower levels have greater authority to take care of things. So a small problem is less likely to turn to a big one. Now, I show the minimum efficient scale where this firm is taking advantage of all the economies of scale, but not experiencing diseconomies of scale as a point minimum. But in reality, some market structures, you have a flat bottom minimum instead of a point minimum. And if this thing was like a long flat bottom here, we would say that the firm is experiencing constant returns to scale, neither economies nor diseconomies of scale. Sometimes there are multiple sizes that result in a minimum efficient scale. Two market structures are likely to have them, two others are not. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, here are some of the examples of the economies and diseconomies of scale. I've already mentioned volume discounts and raw materials and the use of large machine capital and technology as examples of economies of scale. Another one is specialization of labor and management. It's a lot easier for an owner who owns five burger joints to be like a district manager and have a head manager and an assistant manager for each individual location. And they make the operational decisions at the location level, but something that involves a lot of money or a major issue, that's what they pass up to the district manager or the owner. And he handles the bigger marketing and overall operations versus individual location, things like schedules and whatnot. Dividing up the labor and management makes the job easier to do. But again, really small businesses don't have that capability. Usually the owner is the head manager and does the scheduling and does everything. But as get businesses get larger, the owner can't do that. They can't wear that many hats. Some examples of diseconomies of scale. I've mentioned the bureaucracy, but here's a couple of others. Really big companies like Walmart and Target have a lot of money they set aside every year in their budget to settle what are called nuisance lawsuits. These are like slip and fall lawsuits and whatnot where somebody's trying to basically get some money from a big company. And the unfortunate reality is in some cases it's cheaper to settle those lawsuits than it is to fight them and win, which they probably would. That's kind of crazy. But again, smaller businesses are less likely to get sued about this stuff because they don't have the money to pay off these things. Large companies also are frequently on the target of the regulators. As a business gets bigger, the regulators will scrutinize them much more, which means it's much more likely that they're going to end up being the subject of an antitrust lawsuit, an investigation by the health department or what out. This leads to higher costs. And of course, the one I did not mention is inventory shrinkage. That is a term in retail that means merchandise or equipment or items from a store or from a business are either stolen or destroyed by customers by employees or even by suppliers. There was a case of a Walmart in Hawaii where a person that was working for a shipping company that was shipping product from a supplier to Walmart was stealing a bunch of stuff off the truck. As they were being scanned into the Walmart, they were being diverted into another truck and then being resold basically illegally somewhere else. 
Uh, millions of VCRs and DVD players were stolen. This was in the 1990s, as you can tell. And Walmart finally caught them, but, uh, but only if they'd lost about $10 million worth of merchandise because this was a supplier or a vendor employee on a truck driver that was diverting merchandise. And there was a couple of Walmart employees who were complicit. Class, a small business owner, like the owner of a convenience store, is going to have a lot less problems with shoplifting because that's their bread and butter and they can't afford to let that happen. However, a large company like Walmart has insurance against some of this. This is part of the reason why if somebody goes running out of a Walmart with a bunch of merchandise, the security yards don't try to shoot them. Nobody's allowed to chase them because it's going to cost them less money and that person that gets shot or chased may end up suing Walmart and winning a decision. Like I said, really big businesses have these diseconomies of scale, but smaller businesses do not. Now, some amusing things to look at. Some market structures, the economies of scale come quickly. You have to be small to achieve MES, but if you get much bigger than that small size, you experience diseconomies of scale quickly. Like on this graph on the left, I'm saying that to achieve MES, a business has to produce only five one hundredths of one percent. That's a really small fraction of the market output. Class, there's no such thing as more than 100 percent of the market output. 100 divided by 0 0.05 is equal to 2,000. 2,000 very small businesses. Now, what market structure does that sound like? If you said perfect competition, you were correct. Now, the second long run average total cost curve, man, this firm gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it takes a long time before they're big enough to take advantage of all the economies of scale. But then after they hit MES, there's a sudden perky jerk quick rise at the end. It says here that in order to achieve MES for the second market, the firm has to produce 90% class. 100 divided by 90 is 1.11. Bottom line here, y'all, this market can only support one firm at 90%. And the problem is a firm producing 10% would have a much higher average cost of production, so there would not not be a second firm. This market can only support one firm, and it'll end up producing the entire market output. What market structure has one very large business? If you said monopoly of some sort or other, you were correct. Now, remember I told you all about the flat bottoms here? Sometimes you have a constant returns to scale area. And what can happen here is you get some economies of scale. You hit MES and there's a smallest size for MES. There are sizes in the middle and there's a largest size for MES. Now, I gave two possibilities. Possibility number one, suppose the smallest size to achieve MES is 1% of the market output and the largest size is 2.5%. 100 divided by 1 is 100 firms. The most firms this market could support at MES is 100. And then the largest size, 2.5, 100 divided by 2.5 is 40. But the reality is we probably wouldn't have all the firms at the max size. We might have, say, 50 firms with some of them at the largest size, some at some size in between. 2.5% is a medium-sized firm. 1% is a small-sized firm. So we're looking at 50 to 100 small to medium-sized firms. What market structure does that sound like? If you said monopolistic competition, you are correct. But here's one more possibility for the same graph. Suppose the smallest size to achieve MES is 5% of the market output and the largest size is 40%. If we had all the firms at the smallest size for minimum efficient scale, 100 divided by 5 is 20 firms. So the moment a firm is producing 5% of the market output, we call that large. Now, the thing is, we could have two firms produce 40%, but then we could have another one producing 20%, because 20% is in the range for MES. So that means we have three firms. If you're in the 20 to 40% range, you're still considered large. So we're looking at three to 20 large businesses. How many firms is that? Three to 20? What market structure would have three to 20 large businesses? If you said that this is naturally going to be some kind of an oligopoly, you are correct. I want you to understand that market structure has a number of attributes to it and how big a firm needs to be in order to achieve the minimum efficient scale size will determine how many businesses the market could support naturally or by cost structure. The smaller the firms are and the more they are, the more competitive the market it is. The larger the firms are, the fewer firms the market could support, the less competitive and the more like an oligopoly or monopoly it becomes. There's a lot of factors that determine the, uh, the actual market structure for a producing firm. 
be mindful of this. Now, here's one last thing I want you all to look at here. This is the basis of a test problem on your first, on your second unit test, pardon me. I've got a long run average total cost curve, and I've got seven different possible size ranges marked off. If they're producing quantities where I've got my cursor here, that's going to be scale one. If they're producing in between these two hash marks where firm A is, that means that they're at scale two. In between the next pair, scale three. And you notice where the minimum efficient scale is? That's scale four. The minimum point on the long run average total cost curve is scale four. And firm B is currently producing in the short run at scale four. Scale five is past the MES level. Scale six is, is further to the right. And firm C is currently producing at scale seven, which is way far to the right. Now, a couple of things I'm going to ask before we kind of deal with the problem. Which sizes would a firm be passing through if it were to experience economies of scale? In other words, its average total cost would drop in the long run as it got bigger. Well, if you look at the vertical height of long run average total cost as the firm increases from scale one to scale two to scale three, that's where it experiences economies of scale. All right. Through which size ranges would a firm experience diseconomies of scale in this particular example? Diseconomies of scale are where the long run average total cost is getting bigger as size gets bigger. Scale five, scale six, scale seven. So notice firm A at scale two is not taking advantage of all the economies of scale. Firm C is, not, is actually experiencing diseconomies of scale. So now that we've kind of taken a look at this here, what adjustments should firm A make to its size? Remember, they can stay the same, get smaller, or get bigger. Well, firm A is not taking advantage of all possible, all possible economies of scale. So firm A, which would increase its size from scale two to scale four, it would take advantage of more economies of scale. Maybe it's missing out, missing out on some volume discounts on raw materials, or maybe there's some large machine capital it could take advantage of as it gets bigger. Now, firm C is a different situation. Firm C, you'll notice, is experiencing diseconomies of scale. It is too big. Firm C needs to downsize. But we don't just say downsize or reduce in size because downsizing from seven to one would not improve the situation cost-wise. Now, you want to have them shrink their size enough so their average total cost in the long run is minimized. And so reducing size from scale seven down to scale four would achieve that point. It would get rid of those inventory shrinkage issues. It would get rid of the bureaucracy and red tape that is set in. So firm C should reduce its size down to scale four. Firm B doesn't need to change. Like they say in the yearbook sign off, never change. Firm B is taking advantage of all the possible economies of scale, but it is not experiencing any diseconomies of scale. Firm B is at the minimum efficient scale. It's the right size. Now I want you to notice one last thing here. Perfectly competitive producing firms. Class, one of the things we learned already with the other graphs we've worked on is that firms that produce under perfect competition, if they survive and remain in the market in the long run, they will not only achieve the minimum efficient scale, but also they will achieve a long run normal profit, which means the owners will be happy to keep the business running in perpetuity. Having a long run normal profit is what's good enough to keep the business going. The thing is, if they stayed at scale two or at scale seven, they might have a long run economic loss and be forced out of the market because of cost overruns or because of a lack of ability to compete. But at scale four, guaranteeing the long run normal profit is a good thing. All right, so let's wrap this sucker up here in just a moment. Okay. Students, I hope that this helps talk a little bit more about these long run adjustments. I meant to do this video before, but I got sidetracked. I had a little time today, so I'm filling this one in for unit two. So success to y'all. I'll see you in class.